So again, welcome to Journeys in Music with Carmen Constantinescu. Uh, we're very glad you're here today. Um, you. We start. Uh, we start, as we always do, acknowledging that we are not the first people to make music in this place. Uh, the University of Regina, which is where uh, Carmen and I both work, uh, is situated on the territories of the Nehewak, Anishinaabek, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota, and it's the homeland of the Métis Michif Nation. The University of Regina is on Treaty 4 lands with a uh, presence in Treaty 6. And welcome today. So I'm going to say, I know that Carmen has gone, this is what I know of Carmen. I know she plays uh, for the Regina Symphony Orchestra. I know that when I first met Carmen, she was using an anglicized version of her name. Um, and she has moved to Carmen Constantinescu, which is her, I think her, what the name she was born with. And, um, and I know she plays violin and she teaches for us and that she was born in Romania and Beyond that, Carmen, you get to tell us, uh, maybe, is there anything else you want to tell us about your life right now, or a little bit about yourself? Well, my life uh, is quite a story. Okay. <laughs> if, uh, so, uh, I don't know, maybe it will come uh, later in, when, after some, within the questions. Sure. Because I wouldn't know where to begin, like, uh, Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Awesome. So, it's so complex, you know. Yes. Yes. And I, I'm trying to kind of uh, stream it down too. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. You can give us a summary when we, as we go through. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, I, I'm going to start then with um, what I, you've been in several of our conversations. So you know that I have discovered over the last few months that people who play music don't always listen to music, but if you are listening to music, what do you like to listen to? Well, I listen a lot to music uh, and I'm still listening to vinyl repertoire. It's never ending. So uh, in, from various sources, like uh, just recently, I listened to uh, the uh, competitions that are streamed online. Uh, you know, I don't need to, to actually look at them, you know, but I hear all the repertoire and uh, there's quite a few of them, like Menuhin competition for junior and for senior in Richmond, Virginia, which is unfolds as we speak, and uh, Enescu festival in Romania. Uh, but aside from that, yes, I listen to a lot of uh, violin pieces because um, when I started music and uh, throughout my, uh, you know, studying music in Romania the repertoire wasn't that vast, I feel. Like there were pieces that were not ever played. And so I didn't know about them. So we all played like very serious repertoire. But coming here, I discovered basically uh, all the pieces by Chrysler. All those, uh, you know, Fritz Chrysler pieces, uh, they were amazing to discover. And also I discovered uh, Elgar's music which was almost like, I don't think, at least uh, I didn't participate to any concerts in which, except for maybe his cello concerto. Yeah, so uh, basically now I'm in love with Ed Edgar. So I listen every, and I play also, you know, I like listening to pieces that I, I play after, I play them, you know? So uh, yeah, maybe it's a bit narrow down, uh, but of course I, I like uh, orchestral music too, but I'm very much uh, into classical and romantic. I'm not uh, too much uh, 20th century or something, although no, they are titans of it, no. But I'm more of a romantic at heart. So I like uh, those types of pieces. Yeah, awesome. uh, be, be, be them like concertos or short pieces or stuff like that but yeah that's what i'm i'm very conservative <laughs> so, so that's, no that's good so do you find that um listening to other violin pieces inspires you to to try new things oh yeah it does and in fact uh, i uh, ex expanded my repertoire a lot since i've been here and i've been here in canada for 40 years you know and i don't i cannot say that I stopped uh, uh, growing, you know, uh, as far as repertoire, at least. Of course, probably I matured a lot. Uh, but 
yes, that inspires me to uh, to f maybe find other pieces of the same composer, you know. So, and uh, yeah, that's always uh, something that you can expand on. And yeah, that's an inspiration for me. Awesome. And okay. I find fav favorite uh, per performers, you know, so which inspire so, me. To so do you have a favorite right now that you like to listen to? Uh, favorite piece or performer? Um, favorite performer. Well, I like a lot Ray Chen. He's a... Uh, He's famous, he won a few uh, competitions. I like young ones that, uh, of course, but my all time favorite is, uh, and I listen to pieces interpreted by, uh, performed by him, uh, David Oistrach, which is who was the, in my mind, he's the greatest uh, performer and also Henrik Schering. So those familiar, not, not familiar with the uh, violinists, you know, but, but, just remember those names. They are they are great performers. Okay. So I, I I recommend to people listen to that. Awesome. Okay. So um, and then we dive right into the very big question, which is, what does music mean to you? And and I probably need to find a different order because what does music mean to you is a huge question. Um, yes. But. But maybe give us a little taste of what what music, how the role music is in your life, and how how you view music in the world. Well, I thought a lot about that. I knew you are going to put that question. I I, I think every musician asks himself or herself that. But for me, music is a way of life. Like I, even uh, you know, the title of this series, um, like it, journey th with. In, in music or what. So I feel that I'm always traveling in music. You know, I cannot imagine. Uh, so yeah, and of course it's the language of emotions. So I, I kind of, I'm very partial to that side of it, like uh, everything that moves me, you know, and it's so, it goes so deep. So it's not like the other things that you see or touch, you know, it touches you in your, the core of your being and also is dormant there. In a way, you know, kind of like smell. <laughs> it is like you have it in you, and sometimes you hear maybe some harmonies or some melody, and it all comes back to you. So I also was very interesting interested to hear that people that you know, some people that have dementia, they kind of come alive with that. So that's such a big part of uh, the makeup of a human human being. I think if you don't appreciate music, you don't always have to perform it, but if you don't appreciate it, you'll miss on a big chunk of uh, what life is, yeah. So yeah, language of, of course, emotions, and by that I also mean communicating that to others. So I very much look at music, I find as a performer, I always filter it through performing yeah, I don't know. It's uh, they go to, to together. So I don't know how other other people just appreciate it. So I cannot fathom how that would be. It would be interesting to find uh, from uh, other, like um, of course they feel emotions. You know, I think. Yeah, so, but you're right. That's you're right because we do speak about it as musicians and performers. Yes. So that is a, that would be an interesting question to ask someone who's not a musician what it means to them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you are right. Interesting. Yeah. I, I I had a conversation with Sean Earl a few weeks ago um, about the contemporary recordings that the RSO did, and and I've said a couple of times now he's given me a great gift because contemporary music is not my favorite, and and yet in that conversation he gave me a whole new way to listen to it, and like. Because I'm often trying, my my struggle often is that I'm trying to listen for a melody and and find those things that I find in the romantic music that I really appreciate. And and so that was an interesting experience, just hearing a different way to listen to music because I hadn't thought about that before. So yeah, yeah it's an interesting. And you enjoyed it, like, like you yeah. enjoyed it, like yeah, a new experience, of course. Yeah, yeah that's another thing about music. You, you can always find another angle, you know? Like it's never ending. It's, it's very 
exciting. So I never lost my exciting excitement for for this. I love uh, like um, my quote was when we we had the calendar made for the for the orchestra, and my quote was I love what I do and I do what I love. You know, like those are. It just came to me, you know, it's mine. <laughs> or probably many people said that, but I mean, I cannot imagine doing anything else. And it's so satisfying. I think it's in a, in, a, in a kind of way, it's a bit selfish almost. Like it serves me probably greater than it serves <laughs> the audience. I don't know. So sometimes when I play, like I, I have goosebumps or something like that. So, but hopefully that will be transferred. I mean, it will be, communicated yeah I so, think I think yeah. it is I I think yeah. when it moves the musician it trans that translates to the audience as well so mm -hmm. that they, the audience the audience becomes part of the experience of the musician and I I I think that happens I'm mm -hmm. sure it happens yeah yeah so it's very satisfying yeah so okay so let's go back a bit how did you get started playing the violin Hey, you got to that question. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, first of all, I'm not coming, I don't come from a family of musicians. My father can play the fiddle, you know, but you know, like, <laughs> with the, <laughs> the way he looks, by ear, you know. Uh, so he, he has a good ear, and he was musical, but the thing that happened when I was uh, very young, like I, three, I think, I was singing all the time. So what I heard at, uh, you know, on the radio, because at that time, like, and uh, I was uh, absolutely shameless. Like was, you put me in front of somebody, you know, I giving a show. <laughs> so I was playing, uh, I mean, singing when I was uh, traveling by train with my family to go to my grandparents in the North Moldavia there. And people were coming <laughs> from other compartments of the train to see who was singing, you know? So obviously I had a good uh, year, you know? So uh, probably not, uh, I not, was not going to become a singer or something. So my, my parents thought they should uh, put me in a, a special school for which I had to audition uh, because, you know, everything in, I'm coming from a communist country, you know, from uh, like a, behind the iron car or something like that. So everything was uh, subsidized, but you had to qualify for it. So there was only one school. I, uh, I was lucky, I, I lived in, I was born and lived in Bucharest, which is the capital of, uh, so yeah, they, we had a very good uh, music school and uh, music university and stuff like that, yeah. So I, um, and since we didn't have a piano in the house, I chose the violin and uh, they provided me with the violin and everything uh, throughout my life, you know? That was the good side of it. No, the other side, there's many minuses to, to, to that. But in that respect, uh, that's how I ended up. And I took to it, you know? Uh, probably in the beginning, like I didn't express uh, the wish to become, I mean, to play. Probably I found it a bit annoying in the beginning too because it was hard. But, you know, I progressed uh, along the lines that uh, were required. And <laughs> I was lucky that uh, when I got into that school, there were 14 <laughs> places and I was the 13th one. <laughs> so I was one away from uh, maybe not getting. So the story would have been quite different. <laughs> yeah, but then, so that happened when I was six year old. Yeah. So was this the school? Like you obviously you did all the regular school things. To, was it your was it your full, like that was the school you went to for everything? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, and music was a big part of that then. Oh yeah, yeah. But everything else was still the same because not everybody probably you know like something can happen in life. You are not good all the all the I mean to go to the higher uh, levels. Yeah, so you had to know your arithmetics, your geology, <laughs> geometry, whatever. Yeah, history, everything, everything we did, plus that one. So our schedule was very, very uh, busy. 
and also uh, instruction was uh, so um, intense, you know, like we had, uh, since we didn't have to pay for it, you know, like uh, we had uh, twice a, a week, we had uh, lessons with a private teacher and then we had orchestra, we had all those courses in harmony, theory, like that. So uh, choir, yeah, very, very round, uh, uh, yeah, education like that. So that takes you to the end of, say, whatever the equivalent of high the end of high school here would be. Yeah. And then what and did you from, do after that? Yeah, after that, I went to, to university, uh, which I had to also audition for. So there were two big, uh, at the end of high school, you had to give a big, uh, and actually all the transition, you could not go from grade eight into next level. I don't, I'm not very familiar with how you put them here like, to high school. You always had to audition, 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 and to pass, you know? So it was not taking uh, for granted that you are going to make it, you know? So that was actually very stressful. Some people didn't, you know, so. So, and then again, to go to university, big, uh, uh, again, very few places for that and uh, very big competition. Yeah, so from there on I went uh, and I had my bachelor and my master and then I left <laughs> the country, but not quite there yet. I mean, um, the thing is, yes, everything was um, paid for, but you were required at the end of your uh, courses and or, uh, you were required to go where they placed you. So you cannot refuse that and uh, or else you had to, I don't know, go in the army or something like that. We did army too. <laughs> I was in the army. So um, yeah. But uh, so yeah, I was uh, actually placed uh, in a very nice city in Romania to play in that philharmonic. So, but then, okay, th maybe alongside what comes next as questions, uh, I can feel well, in, uh, so the, my next stage. Uh, so. I was gonna ask, what, how did you come to Canada then? Huh. Or when did okay. you come to Canada? Yeah. Well, I came via via a refugee camp in Greece. Oh, so the story is after I was placed uh, in that uh, city to place, I auditioned for the radio, the national broadcast orchestra of Bucharest and I, I got in. And uh, then I, we founded, uh, me and a few colleagues, so we founded the, the quartet of that uh, orchestra and we had a gig let's call it like that it's more than a gig like uh, to represent uh, a country uh, in Greece at uh, in Thessaloniki which was a music festival so since the situation was not great in Romania like uh, many musicians def defected from my my uh, how you call that when your class in when, like your like, class at school or? Yeah, the, the, my year class, like um, I think 80% of us, we are all over the world. So we defected. So in a way music uh, was our passport to go out because not everybody could go out. So you had to be good. To, so then you had the opportunity to go out and maybe not come back if you depends out like some people went out and came back but you always you had family that you had to go back to you know so but anyway so we had this uh, and I, at the end of that uh, festival instead of going back home we three of us the, from that uh, quartet went to, to Athens and we uh, we got through the process of uh, applying for uh, a refugee and we I stayed in that camp for a year and lucky for me, I had the violin with me because that was my, you know, savior because, oh, it was horrible because uh, we went in, I mean, I don't want to go too much in detail, but it was a refugee camp, you know, and people were waiting there and people were 
suicidal and stuff like that. So it was a very dark period, yeah. So lucky for me, then I came, you know, I was ac accepted, I came and uh, then I auditioned to uh, six months into coming uh, to Canada. I auditioned to Montreal Symphony and I got in. And that was my, yeah. So from there on, uh, you know, my professional life in Canada started, yeah. So, okay, so this kind of leads into my next question. So your professional life, so, so really music is what brought you out of Romania. And then, so did you, do you feel like you ever chose to become a professional musician or like, obviously that's where your heart is because you've talked about how, how much music means to you and how it's that emotional, it's at the heart of the being. So did, how, what made you choose was there was there a choice? What made you choose music as your profession? No, it just happened uh, seamlessly. I don't know what time when uh, I didn't question that I was going to become. Uh, but most of us uh, were conditioned that way. Like there was no other uh, thing that I wanted to do more or something like that. Yeah, no. So that in a way was uh, kind of preordained for me but it's very much my choice to pursue it. Actually, given that uh, um, there was a time when I was like in grade six, I changed teachers. So I'm glad you kind of reminded me in a way by that. I was almost going to quit because I was not good for some, you know, I changed teachers and my vibrato was awful. And uh, so I didn't click with them next teacher that I got. So I didn't got good results in uh, exams. So to the point that uh, I was almost going to quit. Yeah, so my point is don't give up, you know, when uh, if you like something so, and also the other thing, I was never, oh, okay, I got the question. Um, I'll answer hand, hand later. Um, so, I also was not very assertive person, you know? So I think music made me come out of my shell. I was very introverted, even shy, you know? I'm still am. <laughs> so then, you know, just uh, I found uh, that I can let all this aside and when I play, you know, I come out and I, so that was, what happened so uh, how could i renounce something like that but there was a period that i did i, I listened to the other speakers that you had uh, in the series and yeah almost nobody said uh, that they weren't successful <laughs> like like but i really struggled and look where i am now so it's good you have to keep doing it if you especially if you love it of course not to to the point that you disregard what other people say to you comes a point when you maybe have to tell your student or you have to be told no you are not uh, cut out for that it's, but you still have to insist yeah it's interesting though because i th i think you're right like we can encourage people but it's the, it, I, what i'm finding in the conversations is that the orchestral world is somewhat different. Like if you're going to be a singer, you can't be a shy and retiring kind of a person in no. order to to make a living doing it. And and I don't I and I don't I don't perceive you as being shy, but that might just be because I talk to you every once in a while at the conservatory and and the orchestra gives you a home in which to present music, right? And so but there is there is something like I know I've said a few times I I have great skill as a musician I would never have been able to make it as a professional musician just because I don't have the personnel I don't have a drive in within me mm -hmm. to make my living that way yeah. so I, I I have chosen other ways to go in order to make my living but and yet I like I love music. I'm passionate about it. I find I resonate with a lot of the things that many of the people have said about what music means to them. And, and I'm like, yeah, that's what it means to me too. And so mm -hmm. it 
there is that sometimes I think, especially as teachers, we see our students and think, honey, you don't have the personality to survive this, right? Yeah. 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 And there are also there is that situation with I also was very uh, anxiety. Um, uh, <laughs> had lots of anxiety, and so I was uh, I had lots of nerves before auditions or stuff like that. But somewhat I'm that wasn't paralyzing, you know. So uh, you so in that respect, you know, music teaches you to kind of. Uh, be in another way, you know, like uh, kind of it makes you better, you know, and then it's so satisfying, you know, for yourself. And also it's a bit of uh, musicians are all a bit of show off. You know? like, look at me, I'm good. You know, you have to have that inner, you know, like uh, valuing yourself. Yeah, you don't have if you have doubts about that. No, no, that doesn't work. So. I always, in my core of my being, I'm, I'm, I'm standing by while I'm <laughs> pr producing that. So I don't even think about other, what other people think about. Yeah, but yeah, so music was uh, a savior for me too. Like I, and also, you know, especially music, when I say music, it's mostly my instrument because like I said, I perceive music through my violin is a kind of part of me. Yeah, so that has been uh, my strength for many a dark time, you know. So, yeah, if you make friends with your instrument, like you always are going to have a part of your life that you feel safe with and nurtured. And yeah, the, the violin or whatever instrument you play or voice will not be, betray you. Now, being th that being said, I also had a few unfortunate. Uh, mishaps with uh, like physically, especially my later years, I fell about three times and I dislocated my shoulder. So every time it and I broke a, a shoulder once. Every time the same way, I, I got into a, I was on the street and I kind of the, it was kind of a edgy thing and I, I fell. Anyway, so that was awfully uh, scary. So I was, you know, but now I'm kind of at the end of my career. So um, I'm happy that I was, I maintained, uh, so I could keep playing. And you know, and the other part of it, yeah, we cannot disregard the, the thing that actually I made a living with it. So that's very, I'm very grateful for that. Yeah, but making a living is not always guaranteed, even if you have a job, like something can happen to you. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. So, but I will still like music. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. Do you want me to answer Han's question? Yeah, I was going to say maybe answer Han's question. And so, what brought you to Regina and how you got here and, and okay, started so, teaching, even? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, for a period of five years where I had my daughters, I didn't do much. So because my daughters were born in Montreal. So uh, I played with Montreal Symphony three years. And then I had, I stood back and I took care of my kids. And uh, then, so of course I didn't play anymore, which like I resigned from orchestra. And then after five years, um, there was an opening in Regina. I was keeping an eye on, uh, you know, the musical situation like that. I wanted to come back to, to playing, not only teaching on the side or something like that. And there was a position for uh, principal second violin, Han. <laughs> like he is, a, you are principal violin, Han. Okay. So I took that, but that was for a year. So at the end of it, had it not uh, been uh, that was an opening for concert master for which I auditioned, I would have had to, I don't know what I would have done because that was over. And by that time I was already here with the family and everything. So I auditioned for concert master, I got that. And um, I didn't get my tenure as concert master, but I was offered the, assistant because the assistant concert master at the time uh, left 
So it was a kind of a, like fortunate events that I could co continue. I took a kind of a big risk coming just for one year. Yeah. So from there on, uh, which is kind of going on uh, 32 years now, I've been in Regina as on the, as a assistant concert master. And uh, conservatory, as soon as I came, I got a class and actually it's funny that you mentioned uh, Dan Schultz. He was living at that time for Winnipeg. So he left me my, the entire class that he got. So I got his students, yeah? So from there on, yeah, I kept teaching and yeah, so that is uh, oh, how I got to be here. We know you're enthusiastic about the performing part. Do you enjoy the teaching as well? Oh yeah, and I find I enjoy more and more. That's why I'm so interested in uh, all this competition and uh, like how young people, because I still, I still learn about myself even, you know, like you have to explain to the, to the student. And I, f I find myself sometimes I'm looking at myself, like, how do I do it? <laughs> you know, and then I explain to them, aside from, of course, knowing pedagogical stuff and stuff, because I studied that too. But um, yeah, I absolutely love it. And I'm hoping to go on even after I'm going to probably in two or three years, I'm not going to be that <laughs> nimble, probably. So then that will be my kind of, uh, fall back on, uh, so I will never, until, you know, you remembered how Howard Leighton Brown, till 96. Yeah, he was teaching like two weeks before he died, yeah. Yes, no, and yeah. students infuse you with so much uh, youthfulness and so much energy, it's so uh, refreshing and actually teaching through Zoom all uh, in COVID time, they were like a breath of fresh air, so I was mm. looking to the to the lessons I came out of them energized yeah I still do because it's still over zoom yeah. yeah and it's so satisfying when you tell them something and they do it or when you help them through yeah so uh, it's a give and take but it's wonderful to be a teacher yeah so so pre pre or po well pre-covid what does pre what did a typical work day look like for you Okay, so pre-COVID, um, like just my colleagues that you interviewed before, so it's pretty much up to you. I mean, up to me, how it, it looks. And depends uh, on the, sometimes we have harder repertoire or something that we never played. But, uh, so yeah, I always practice about two hours a day anyway, because I don't even call it practice. So when I'm not practicing, really focusing on, uh, uh, orchestra repertoire, I'm, I'm playing by myself. I don't know, you can be, believe me, but I, every day I give myself recitals. And you know, I found uh, these days technology being what it is, you can find on YouTube all the accompaniments to the these wonderful pieces that uh, I much love. And so I play to, to, together with, with that. And actually I'm going to use some of that uh, when I'm having my, uh, let's advertise my short gems uh, pieces or something for violin that's going to be on uh, July 10. I'm going to play some of my favorite pieces, uh, Elgar, and I'm going to mix a bit of, uh, there's a, some jazz style and some Romanian folk music. So I'm so much looking forward to, to, to that. And these days I'm still thinking about just that 30 minutes uh, <laughs> program. I want to cram everything into there, you know? Because before COVID, I was preparing a recital with Judy Lebec. We had the rehearsal and stuff like that. And uh, I have oh, well, like hour and a half big program. And that fell, you know? So now I'm aching to play and uh, perform. But so that's how my uh, day will look, uh, you know, practice. And of course at night or the, there are weeks in the morning we have rehearsal at night. Uh, so they alternate. But I would say, because your question was how my day looked, my 
they almost never pass by without me playing my violin. And I want to bring in here what Yehudi Menuhin said, like uh, you have to have your violin out or the violin it's like a bird. You don't imagine the, uh, a bird not flying. So you have to fly every day. I mean, play, I mean, it's a metaphor, but, or something like that, yeah. So I, I like keep that. it, uh, I keep it out and uh, ready. So that also um, brings me to the fact, now, like, let's see what other question you have. Maybe I can tie in what I want to, to say next. Yeah. No, you can, you can tell me whatever you want to tell me. Um, okay, so no, but let's I see. Would... Yeah. I would, maybe I'll ask, um, maybe I'll ask this one. So what do you know now about being a full-time musician that you wish you had known when you were younger? Are there things that you know now that you've, you've learned in your lifetime about being a full-time musician that you, you know, when you, I, when you dreamt of it, maybe from Montreal, you know, thinking I'm going to go to Regina, I'm going to play in a symphony. This is what my life is going to look like. Are there things you learned between then and now? Of course I learned, but you know, the answer to the main question is there's nothing I, want to, I wanted to know. I liked, I mean, what, how could I have I known? I could not have. And probably if I would have known that it's going to be down the road harder or something like that, maybe I would have, you know, pulled away from it. No, I don't regret any, I, I mean, I didn't need to know anything. Everything I learned, I dealt with and made me better yeah okay so I so the other to... question i have then is is what kind of changes have you seen because you've been in regina now for 30 years as an orchestral player and a teacher so what kind of changes have you seen in the musical world kind of well even from your time in montreal because you know you talk about coming for a year that that was a big risk and i know a few years ago we had um I think it was a clarinetist who came, who was flying in from the Maritimes because he didn't want to move his family quite yet. He wanted to make sure it was a long-term thing before he moved his family, but you moved your family here. And so are there other changes that you've seen in terms of how things just work in the music world? Well, changes uh, were already big uh, between Montreal and uh, here. So, but that being said, again, I did, I would have not wanted to know, <laughs> probably I would have not. <laughs> yeah, it was quite a big change because uh, you know how Montreal, it, the spectrum of like from Montreal to here is such, you know, that's such a big orchestra and it's uh, managed completely different. They have a whole other, um, yeah. So there were changes already, but I think in Regina, it got better and better. So Regina is better now than when I came, for, I think, from the point of view of the orchestra. So, uh, yeah, other changes, of course, from a big uh, difference already from uh, the way things worked when you play orchestra in, uh, on the other side of the, you know, like, especially in communist uh, times. So yeah, there were many changes, but also what I found, I like that there were lots of changes for women, I think, uh, here, like, women play all kinds of instruments, which uh, when I was a young, uh, even lady in Romania, like, I never thought that women can play horn or can play uh, bass and stuff like that. And women are now, they can play anything and they are awesome at, 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 at that, yeah. So that change uh, pleased me very much and kind of uh, it's good uh, inspiration for anybody that, so you can do anything, yeah. So change is not so good uh, like uh, the fate of classical music, audience and stuff like that, probably that went a bit down, but I'm very, hopeful for the what will be next because uh, this young generation that comes up they have the same passion for for instrument and you know uh, they have a different approach i want to bring this here i don't know if you heard of uh, two set 
to say to these those two guys from uh, Australia uh, that uh, have uh, already three million subscribers. They just talk about violin music and like two nerds, you know. But they are. Uh, you have to check them out, and and they are funny, and you know. So they kind of uh, pulled all the young generation and even older, like like me, into that. So there's new breathing into all of that. So if changes uh, like a bit went down, but now uh, I think things are going up. Well, it's yeah. interesting you say that because because uh, we're. You're right. I like we hear a lot about that, right? We hear a lot about, you know, the decline of classical music and orchestras and things. And yet there are places where there's life coming. And and in some ways, the internet has allowed us to find our community, right? And yeah, so yeah, right. you can find these guys in Australia that are violin nerds that talk about things. And yeah. and that that has allowed us in an, in a different way to find it may not be our live audience in Regina, but it, but to find people that that are kind of like kindred spirits, um, and that and that are passionate about the same things we are. So it's yeah, it's an interesting time to be here. Yeah, it is. It is, and uh, I think that's a positive side of uh, what happened. Now we are still connected, although like different, but maybe more like broader. Yeah. Like that, and you know, when you say like uh, maybe not in Regina, but you know, considering the per percentage of people, like young people in schools, like that, uh, my students tell th their friends or something like that, and you know, there's a new generation coming up that will have picked up those signals that actually music uh, it's interesting and it's it's hip to be. It's not like you know the only the one that's very kind of focused on, on, on that. And also there's many, many areas in which you can be, you can teach, you can play, you can uh, be a recording, uh, you know, musician, stuff like that. Uh, yeah, so it's not uh, too restrictive. Yeah, so you can ex oh, experiment and collaborate with maybe other artists in other media. That's exciting. Yeah. There's some very exciting. I agree. There's some very exciting things happening. Yeah, so we have so, about two minutes left. Okay. Wow. Did I, did I know it went fast, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So is there anything else you want to tell us that I didn't ask about? Well, I guess you didn't ask me what I'm passionate about, but I already answered that question. <laughs> I mean, there can be no, like I couldn't do anything else. And also I want to just bring in uh, just uh, the the knowledge that I was very fortunate to uh, um, to work a bit for a summer with uh, in Yehudi uh, Menuhin uh, um, Academy uh, um, in the one summer. So I had lessons with the Yehudi Menuhin. So that was the highlight of my existence, I think. Yeah, so I was fortunate in being able to do that. So yeah, my heroes are musicians. Yeah. They're, those are good people to have as heroes. Yes, yeah. And also, you know, like, um, I just want to bring this uh, in that um, having a family also, it's uh, kind of, uh, the, these things don't clash, you know, like many people say, oh, you know, like it was hard, I had to rear my children, but still you find a way, you know, like that. And uh, I think even family is better for that because they see you doing that and then you model that for, so you go through the hard times, but then, yeah, you have something to show for it and you instill the, those values in yeah so that i'm saying awesome i think that's a good place to stop thank you so much yeah Karen, for sharing all those thoughts i will stop the recording yeah